Many years ago in the 80s, I did a lot of work in the Philippines. Great, great moves of the Spirit there, and I hope to tell you some about that. But on one occasion, as we were gathering, they brought a chair out. And uh, so I asked the pastor, I said, what's that? And he said, well, that's to remind us that Jesus is here. He is in our midst because when two or three gather together, he is among us. And of course, for those who have received Jesus as Lord, he is within us. So he is both in us and among us. And so I thought, how beautiful that is that they would use that as a visual aid that although we cannot see him, he is more real and more mighty and more present than any of us could possibly comprehend. And yet he is here. See, and that, that's the beauty of the Lord, that he is ever present. And that's why he says he's an ever, ever present. And even in the midst of our needs, he's ever present. Even though the needs overshadow his presence and overwhelm us such that we sometimes uh, lose sight of him or lose conscious of him. And, uh, but nonetheless, he is here. Now, I'd like for us to start with one scripture that I would want us to make a prayer uh, for not only today, but uh, Lord willing, throughout your lifetime, and you may already pray this prayer, but Psalm 119, verse 18. And as you know, Psalm 119 is a beautiful psalm that just goes on and on about the Lord and, and the amazing uh, things regarding His Word. But in, in Psalm 119, and there in verse 18, uh, David expresses his heart cry to the Lord, his prayer, and he says, Open mine eyes, that I might behold wondrous things out of your law. But of course, now, because of the New Testament and the New Covenant, we can say, out of your word. Because the whole counsel of God is now available to us, and so our prayer and our desire is, Lord, open my eyes. And of course, he's referring there not to his physical eyes, as you well know, but his spiritual eyes. And so our prayer would be continuously... Lord, open my eyes. And that does take us back to the floodgates being open, but then the dam that blocks the flow. So, Lord, remove the barriers, the blockages, the hindrances, so that I can truly see Jesus, see him high and lifted up in my midst, high and mighty in my presence, and be conscious of his presence among us. So, Lord, open my eyes. So, let, let's make that and uh, make that your prayer. Uh, let's just take a moment for you to say that before the Lord. Uh, Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things from your word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. Amen. So, Lord, we're trusting that. And thank you for it. I would like for us to go on a journey of presence through the life of Jacob in our times together in the morning. We'll do something a little different at night. And in the afternoons, we're going to have more of a, uh, I'll, I'll do a recap of maybe last night and this morning, and then we'll just talk about it and share it together and, and if Q&A or whatever uh, the Lord might want. But that's kind of the, the sense that I have as we move forward. But for now, let's go uh, to Genesis 25. We'll, we'll see from the beginning about the Lord's presence in the life of Jacob. And the thing that we want to notice early on about Jacob's life is how, how very present the Lord was, how very active he was, and yet how Jacob and his family were oblivious to the Lord's presence or to the Lord's provision and protection. And God is so often looking out for us, and we don't even recognize His hand and His mighty works in our midst. And the tragedy of that is, the more mindful we are of His presence in our life, and the more conscious we are of His presence in the moment, the more likely we're going to be to rely upon Him, cooperate with Him, and experience the fullness of His presence and power in our life. Not just the mercy drops, but the continuous flow of His life, of, his, uh, of, of the character, of His nature, His fruit, of His spirit, of His gifts, all that He is in the moment. And so 
the, the emphasis about manifest, the manifest presence of God, is that we might tap into that manifest presence as a continuous way of life. Not just as an occasional uh, visitation, but as a continuous manifestation of Him who is the Christ, the living Christ. So that's, that's our desire, and that's our prayer as we move forward with this. Now, Genesis 25, and uh, we start with Jacob's father Isaac. In verse 20, it says, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. So, uh, we see there that Jacob's parents are Isaac and Rebekah. Now, you're very familiar with the scripture, so you know the story. The next thing that happens is they're eager to have children, as is, is the case for most of us and when we get married. And, and However, it didn't happen. So then, in verse 21, it says, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. Um, she couldn't have children. And then it says, and the Lord was entreated of him. So that means the Lord responded to his prayer. The Lord answered his cry, and the Lord addressed his need. And so the end result was, not only did she get one, but she got two. She had twins. And it's like, well, what is this? Because she feels this turmoil inside, and she says, what's going on? I, I feel like uh, my whole insides are being turned upside down, you know? And they were. And so then, interesting now that she and her husband both consulted the Lord. So this is important in presence that the thing is you just start talking to him. When stuff goes on in my life, I first and I ask the Lord a lot of questions. Let me say this. But my when something happens is, Lord, what is this? What is this? Tell me what is this? I mean I know what it is. Something happens, somebody hits me with their car, or whatever, but Lord, what is this? There's something bigger going on. You show me from your point of view the bigger picture. So I can cooperate with you in whatever it is. And so, Lord, what is this? So there, that's what Rebecca does. She says, well, Lord, what's going on here? And she went to the Lord and, and inquired of him. She asked him a question. So ask the Lord a lot of questions. You'll see much more of the Lord's manifest presence if you just talk to him about everything that goes on so he can manifest his presence in a way that will accomplish his purpose and will certainly meet your needs. So that's, that's just up front what's going on here. So then they have this conversation with the Lord. He explains to them, verse 23, two nations are in your womb, two manner of people. Um, then he summarizes that in verse 23. He says, the one will be stronger than the other and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, we know in the created order there was the first man, Adam, and then Jesus came along and he was noted as the second Adam or the second man or the last man. And so what we have here is somewhat of a parallel between what's going on here between the first and the second. So that what God does then is he says, well, <clears throat> I know that traditionally the firstborn is the one that gets the blessing and the birthright. And he's the one that's the chosen one. But he said, but my way is different because as we know, God's ways are different than man's. And so God says, and here's my way. He says, I'm going to choose the second born. The blessing and the birthright will go to the second born. He will be the one that will carry the seed that will ultimately end up as the seed, Jesus Christ. So Abraham and his seed, singular. And so in the process, we're going to come out on the end here with Jesus Christ. But he's going to be the conduit for Christ. And so God is saying, my hand is on him. He's the chosen one as far as I'm concerned. So, um, so now we see from conception that God's hand is, is on Jacob. So his presence is there at conception in Jacob's life. And then we move forward here a little bit. Well, let's, let's just back up and, and just... Um, so, so here they are. They can't have children and then they do. So we'd call that a miracle. God did something supernatural to, to address the problem, whatever it was, so that, uh, so that uh, uh, Isaac was able to, well, we don't know if the problem was on his side or hers, but it says she was barren, so we have to assume maybe it was on her side. So Rebecca has the child, and this is the work of God. Um, Taking back to the story in the Philippines, uh, while I was there, 
on one occasion, uh, the pastor that I worked with most closely was named uh, Pastor Ben, and he was an amazing brother, and I'll tell you maybe more about him later. But anyway, the thing about him was he started out with nothing, and God just raised him up. And uh, when I first met him, he already had 17 churches that he had started from a little bitty uh, church in, in the resettlement village for all the poor people. And he just had this amazing presence and anointing of God. And so, so we worked very closely. I was there with him a couple of times a year. And uh, on this one occasion, his vehicle, which was already quite old, kept breaking down. So we would get out and push the car, or we'd get out and wait till they'd go get help to go get a part and get it fixed. And I'd help him work on the car. <laughs> it was hot, as it always is. And so I'm sitting there talking to the Lord. And I said, now, Lord, this definitely, uh, it's time for him to get a car. And when he came back, he said, you know, he said, uh, I've really been praying for an automobile. And I said, oh, good, because I've been praying for you, too. And my pastor friend here has been praying, and we're with you on that. And uh, we have a small amount we could contribute to that, but uh, uh, we got to believe God for a miracle. And he said, yeah, I am. And he said, I already got the car picked out. And I said, oh, yeah, great. Uh, he said, well, you, you need to come see it. So he took us down <laughs> into the brand-new car dealership, and there on the uh, showroom floor was this beautiful white uh, new automobile. It was uh, at Mitsubishi, I think. I don't know. But whatever. Anyway. And so he said, this is, this is the one that's on my heart to have. And he said, I need a new car that's dependable because it, I'm always having people over here. It's breaking down. And he traveled all over the Philippines in his, in his automobile to go and minister to these churches and pastors that he had started. So I'm sitting there thinking to myself, my, first, my, my thoughts are, well, first of all, I want him to have it. But then, I, but then the second thought, which is usually the wrong thought, but it's the temptation. So then the thought was, now, wait a minute. Uh, I, I, the only time I ever got a new car was back before I was filled with the Spirit and didn't know Christ as life. So back then I didn't have a clue and I went out and just did it. You know? <laughs> and since then I haven't had a new car and I'm over here in America. And then I'm thinking, well, but on the other hand, Lord, uh, what do you say? You know, let's check it out. So... So I talked to the Lord, and the more I prayed about it, the more I had this definite assurance. I sensed the man had faith to believe that this was the car God had for him. That God put it in his heart. This was his car. So I told my other pastor friend and the other uh, lay minister that was with me, I said, okay, I believe God wants us to pray and believe God for the car. So I said, come on. So we gathered around the car, and there's the salespeople over there and the manager and all that. And so... I said, we're going to lay hands on the car. <laughs> this sounds a little radical, but this is what I got. So I just do what God shows me. So anyway, I laid hands on the car. They all did. And we said, okay, Lord, this is going to be a huge miracle. I think at the time the car was something like $17,000 for that car. So, Lord, we are receiving $17,000, the money. And we thank you now for this car for my brother here. That it's going to be his ministry tool to take the gospel all over the Philippines like that. And so, so we... Um, we went back rejoicing, and I gave him my $100 or whatever I had left in my cash, and, and my friends gave him a little bit, and he'd had a little bit he'd been saving up, and so maybe he had $1,000, I don't know. And then he, he said, well, he had, so he called the board and told them that we'd been praying about it, and so one of the board members was, a, was an engineer at a company, and he said, okay, well, I can put in a 1000 or whatever. And then, um, then what happened was that this board member, who was an engineer, he knew two uh, Chinese businessmen who lived in the Philippines, and they were um, both beneficiaries of Ben's ministry. Because what had happened was, on one occasion, this, um, this engineer, this Filipino man, told Pastor Ben, he says, hey, this family can't have children, this Chinese couple, and they really want a child. And I told them how God ministers through you, and they said they would like for you to come and pray. So he went over and prayed for them. And God did a miracle and healed her womb. And so then they had children. And so and they were very grateful. And then that, that man told his other friend, the Chinese businessman. And then that guy said, well, I got the same problem here. We can't have a child either. So Pastor Ben went over and prayed for them. And bam, they had a child. And so it's like everywhere Pastor Ben went, I mean, things happen, you know, and like big stuff, you know. And so... Uh, babies and all that good stuff. So this engineer friend, he called these two Chinese guys and he said, hey, Pastor Ben is in need of a car and we're believing God for, for a miracle and we want you to pray about it and if there's any way you can help, well, let us know. And so they both put their heads together and before 
before I left the country, he was the owner of that exact car on the floor. <laughs> but it came out of these, uh, primarily from these two uh, Chinese businessmen and not, their wives not being able to have children. And then God did these miracles and then bam, comes the children and, and there's the car. So uh, we look at the things that are humanly impossible and we say, with God all things are possible. We say, until it comes to our personal problem or crisis or need. And then suddenly we get weak need and we buckle under. And it's like we begin to wonder, well, I know God can, I know God has, but... And then all these what ifs and, and all the doubts and the buts and the questions begin to come up that begin to undermine and actually uh, stir up in us uh, doubts and unbelief. Now, on the other side, God wants to stir up our heart to lay hold of Him. He wants to, to, to cause us to, to hear Him and, and so we can then trust Him. And so we have a man here, Jacob, who's born of, of a miraculous birth, handpicked by God, chosen of God for a purpose, to be the one who will now bring forth this, this other manner of people that would be the stronger and, and he as the younger would take the authority over the elder. So he will have the seniority here. He will be the, uh, the, the upper hand and he will have, the, it's not so much like, I know it uses the word serve there, but it's not like we're thinking about how that, um, that, that Esau is going to be his slave or, or that he's going to be his boss in that sense. But he will have the authority. He will have the supremacy. He will have the birthright and the blessing. See, it will be God's working through him as his chosen instrument and chosen vessel to achieve kingdom purpose. So then we, we look a little further, and remember now we're on a journey of presence. And then they, they grow up and they're maybe teenagers, I don't know what, maybe early college age type kids or something in their 20s. But... Nonetheless, so Esau goes out and he's, he's the outdoorsman and there's some important things to see here about Esau and Jacob. Esau is outdoorsman, he's rugged, he's rough, he's tough, and so he's the daddy's boy, okay? But now Jacob, he's sort of quiet and reserved, he loves to help in the kitchen and all that, so he's the mama's boy. And I mean, and you, and you see this pattern come forth. So we have here the strong outgoing personality of Esau and the, and the introverted personality of Jacob. So we've got the extrovert in Esau and the introvert in Jacob. And these are the personality types. And by the way, this is a pattern for all of life. This is a pattern for all of life. And so, uh, but here's the pattern. And so Jacob is doing his thing, cooking a meal, and his brother comes in from the, the, the hunt, and he's exhausted, and he's famished. Now it's interesting how dramatic this story goes because <laughs> okay I've been hungry but I've not been starving but apparently Esau acts like he's starving like really starving because he says fix me some food and his brother says well I've got some here but but it's going to cost you and now we see now we see the the attitude and the disposition of Jacob he's a manipulator uh, he's a deceiver and so he's, he's already scheming in here. He's got a plan going. He's going to try to get by any means the birthright and the blessing. So he's, he wants to be number one. Now what he doesn't know is that the very desire that's in his heart is of God. But the sad thing is, as in most of our lives, we spend most of our life trying to get something that's already ours and trying to become somebody we already are. See, because in Christ, we have the birthright and the blessing. But we spend all of our lives trying to get it. We try to do all these things to please God. We do all these things to appease God. All these things to become more like Christ. All these things to get what we already have in Christ. And to become what we already are in Christ. So is Jacob's story here. So he, he does his little deal and negotiates. And of course his brother says, well what do I need uh, this thing for anyway? What's birthright to me? I mean I, I'm a self-made man here. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm bold and confident. I can do anything. I, I, I don't need anybody. I don't need anything. So I don't, who cares about a birthright? So take the old grummy thing. It means nothing to me anyway. That's, what he, that's kind of his attitude. 
And thus Esau despised his birthright, verse 34. And he sold it to Jacob. <clears throat> so then we see in chapter 26 how God is going to protect his investment. So he's going to protect Jacob, even though Jacob is, is very deceitful and manipulative. But God has a higher purpose. And God's higher purpose is going to work through this and overcome this. Even though right now, it's an uphill battle, it seems. So in, in uh, chapter 26, um, verse 1 talks about how there was a famine in the land. And, and in such times as that, t typically, if, if there was no more food or provision, you just go off to some other country, wherever you can go to get help and food and whatever, and, which was common and sometimes happened. And, and, you know, and, and, but not this time. So the Lord appeared... Um, and he appears there, and he says, Do not go down to Egypt, verse 2, but dwell in the land which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, I will be with you, I will bless you. So see, God is saying, you just go where I tell you to go, do what I tell you to do, and I'll take care of you. See, I'll be with you, that's my, my presence. I will bless you, that's my provision and my protection. So he says, I'm going to take care of this. And so God made sure... That, uh, that Jacob was properly cared for and protected uh, through his lifetime as he's growing up here and moving forward in life. And, but then there came a time when, uh, when his, his father, uh, uh, Isaac, uh, began to be ill. And so he, uh, he told him, he told uh, Esau, he said, you know, you... You need to fix me one last meal, like a farewell dinner, because I think I'm near the end and it's going to be my time to go. But, I, but before I go, he says, I want to, to invoke a blessing over you, which was the uh, tradition in that day, as you well know. Um, and then, um, so he tells him, now we're in chapter 26, uh, 27, I'm sorry, chapter 27. So he says, uh, verse 8, now therefore my son obey my voice and and this and that, and, and then um, verse 10 he says, and you shall bring it, but, but then, no, I'm sorry, so then uh, Rebecca overheard this. She overheard what, uh, what Isaac was telling Esau, and she decided, I better get in on this. Now here's the problem with fathers and mothers, mama's boys and, and uh, daddy's boys and all this, uh, we start taking sides, and so mama decides she's got to help God out here. Now, and so here's how it's going to have to happen. Well, I've got to look out for my son because actually he's better than Esau and I like him better and, and so I've got to take care of him. So she starts telling him how he's going to lie to his father and deceive his father and deceive his brother. Now, this is the mother promoting all of these ungodly acts, but she's doing it, she thinks, for the best interest of her child. Now... We say the end justifies the means, and maybe it's true sometimes. However, it certainly did not in this case. And so the mother, um, Rebecca, has got her plan, and so she told her son there. She told Jacob, now, verse 8, Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. And then verse 10, uh, And just go out and, and uh, you get this thing together and get the meat and take care of this and, and cook the food, and, and you shall bring it to your father, verse 10, and that he may eat, that he may bless you before his death. In other words, we're going to... We're going to, not only did you do good in, in that you, you stole the birthright, but I'm going to teach you how to steal the blessing. And so that you'll be sure and get the blessing. I want to make sure you get it. So you know the story. They went through all the whole ordeal. And, and we got the, the, the wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, because she puts on all this, uh, the, um, from the goats, the hairy arms pretending to be his brother. And, and look at the lies that he tells. I mean, straight up lies to his father. So he starts going along here, and um, we're still in chapter 27. And uh, so Jacob shows up, and he says, Who are you, my son? Verse 18, the father asked uh, Isaac. And so then Jacob, verse 19, and Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I am Esau. Now, is that true? Absolutely not. So straight up lie to his father. I am Esau, your firstborn. Now, he's not Esau, and he's not the firstborn, so he said, but he said it. And then, of course, then he ends up by saying, but I want your blessing, verse 19. Then, in verse 20, 
So his father Isaac says, wow, this is amazing. You, you really did this quick. I mean, you went out, you killed the animal, you came back, you got the meal. I mean, this is, this is some pretty amazing stuff here. He says, how are you able to do all this? And now, get this, now he takes the Lord's name in vain. And he said, because the Lord, your God, see, your God, not his God, but your God, the Lord, your God, brought it to me. So he's, he's using God's name to justify his sin, to justify his own actions. And he pawns it off on God. Okay, so God did this, and that's how I'm able to be so good. Wow, it sounds pretty spiritual. Now, how many times have we said, well, don't thank me, just thank the Lord. And we don't mean that at all. So oftentimes people really down deep, they're feeling good. It's like, wow, man, they finally, finally appreciate something I'm doing around here, you know. <laughs> finally get a little pat on the back, boy, you know. And it's like, oh, don't, but don't thank me, don't, don't thank me. Because we're taught to say that, and correctly so. But the attitude of our heart is... And the, and the thought of our mind is, well, it's about time somebody appreciated me around here. See, that's because that's where the carnal mind goes. That's where the way of the flesh operates. Well, anyway, so he's, he's in that situation. That's his mode. And so the thing plays out, as we know. And then Esau shows up right after he has done his little trick and deceived his father and got his father to pray the blessing over him. And Esau shows up and says, well, here I am, Dad, and I got, I got, you know, I'm ready. To, and uh, what? Who are you? Where did you come from? Well, I, who was this other? And he said, well, it's my brother. Isn't he rightly named Jacob? He, he's a supplanter. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a cheat. He's a thief. Come on. His father's the devil. What can we say about that? You know? And so he lays in here with, with great um, anger toward his brother. So in verse 41... And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing. And then he thinks to himself, okay, I'll tell you what. I respect my dad. I love my father, so I'm not going to do anything while he's alive. But as soon as dad dies, I'm taking this guy out. I'm going to slay him. I will kill him. He said, I'm going to put an end to this. I'm going to get my birthright and blessing back because he'll die and I'll get it all back. Well, of course, it didn't quite play out that way. And uh, so... What happened then is, as you know, um, Mama got into the picture again, and she said, well, I better get him out of here fast, because now things I, I, I've really made a mess of things, but I can always fix it. So that's the way the flesh operates. We mess up, and then instead of just repenting and seeking God with godly sorrow and trusting Him, we just try to fix it up. Well, look at Adam and Eve. They, they, they went and hid behind the bush, and then they start blaming each other and all that, and then, you know, whatever. We're always trying to cover up and hide instead of just straight up admit it. I, our children, when they were growing up, uh, things would happen. And, you know, it, it was like what we would say in the old day, like pulling teeth to get them to admit <laughs> when they were wrong. And I'd say, look, just say you're sorry, just admit it, and let's get on with it. But they'd drag it out and drag it out and drag it out. And it was like they'd try to hide it and they'd try to blame each other and they'd try to deny it and this and that. I said, just say you're sorry and let's get on with it. You, and that's the way God wants in us, you know. If we fall down, he says in Proverbs, just get up eight. Just recognize, okay, you fell. And then just get up. Just repent. Step up to it. Admit that you were wrong and move on. But anyway, it doesn't always work that way in life. And so we have to learn the hard way. That's why we call it the school of hard knocks. So then, uh, so anyway, uh, Isaac uh, told Jacob that it's time for you to move on. But here's the interesting thing now. Something significant happens in, in, uh, in uh, Genesis 28. So Isaac called Jacob, and he, he's going to give him a charge now and a blessing. And so he told him in verse 2, Okay, arise and, and go to uh, your, your mother's family and just go... And, and you'll be safe there. And so you go over there with them. And, uh, and maybe uh, through Laban and his family, you'll, 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 you'll find a place you can go and, and you'll be protected. And you can find a wife over there among their, their people. Then in verse 3, he says, And God Almighty bless you. Now suddenly, suddenly we see the truth. There's only one source of blessing. It's from God. The earthly blessings are nice to have 
but not necessary. But the one we must have, the one we cannot live without, is the blessing of God. So in verse 3 he says, And God Almighty bless you. God Almighty make you fruitful. God Almighty multiply you, that you may be a multitude of people. Which was, of course, the promise, going back to what he promised Abraham, what God promised Abraham. Then in verse 4, And he, and God Almighty, would give you the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham. That God would impart it to you. To you and to your seed with you. That you may inherit the land. You see, the true blessing comes from God and God alone. The birthright is God's prerogative. And so that must be our source it must be in the Lord. We must look to Him for the birthright and the blessing. So, so uh, all the promises in Him are yes and amen, amen. in Christ. And see, and so um, in uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 3, who has blessed us, God, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So Christ is the seed. And so all the blessing and the birthright are bound up in the person of Christ. So when you're in Christ, all the, birth, the birthright and the blessings are your inheritance. They are yours in Christ, not because of works of righteousness you've done, not because of any merit on your own, but solely because you are in Christ. And when you're in Christ, the birthright and the blessing, the blessings of God, are yours. Because of Christ in you, because of His life in you, and his life then becomes your life. So they, they part ways. And um, what is our... Um, so we, we should... Um, we, we, we could talk about this some. We're kind of at a transition point here. We're about to see a shift here. So we, we can talk about this some and, and see where we go from here. We might want to continue on our study this morning or we can... Just talk and pray about where we are. So, um, what what is your sense so far about the journey of presence and as regards uh, uh, Jacob's life? What, anything, I, Lord? Yeah, and not only that, I'm amazed that uh, Isaac didn't come down on him. As I was rereading several times prior to our today, I, I just never caught that even his father didn't tell him what for. I mean, you know, <laughs> as a father, I was pretty quick to point out to my kids when they had uh, missed the mark. You know, I made sure they knew that this is not of God. This is not uh, the right way to live and to conduct your life. You know, I, um, yeah, it's because. You know, we start out in life, and as Jesus told his number one main man, Peter, he says, you know, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. So, uh, let's just think about Peter for a moment. Uh, I don't know, we'll get back to him, but uh, his story in Matthew 26, 41, is where he says, your spirit is willing, your flesh is weak. So, and then Jesus said, actually, prior to that, um, he said, I'm going to go to the cross now and you're all going to go your separate ways and you're all going to deny me. And you remember, Peter became very adamant and said, no, uh, they may, but I never will. You know, like, I promise. You know, how, how often have we done that? I promise. You know, we, well, and, and husbands or wives, you know, we'll tell each other, well, I promise. You know, <laughs> well, yeah, good intentions. But Jesus knew Peter didn't have the stuff in him to deliver. And so Jesus said, well, you can say what you will, but in fact, it'll happen three times. So then, of course, sure enough, Peter denied the Lord three times. Now, Jesus was not in any way disappointed or angry or upset with Peter. In fact, hey, okay, you did just exactly what I promised you to do. <laughs> you, would do. you did what I knew you would do. You know. Now, I don't even think Jesus was hurt, per se, because he understood that this was all Peter could do. He knew that Peter loved him. He knew that Peter sincerely wanted to do right by him, but he knew that he didn't have the ability to do it because that's the whole reason Christ had to go and die and rise again because only the life of Christ in us by His Spirit would enable us to fulfill the commitments we make to the Lord. I mean, 
he, he was sincerely wrong. He just could not stay the course and could not uh, hold the line. So when all these people came, even to the end, that third one, he curses, man. It's like, it, I mean, he's, he's vehement. It's like blankety blank to blank, you know. And I mean, it's like he's just telling them, you know, what for? I, I am not one of these guys. I'm not one of these that you think I am. So he takes the same approach to the opposite. Whereas here we've got Jacob saying, oh, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Esau. And yeah, the Lord did it. And he's saying, no, I have nothing to do with the Lord. You know, and, and in fact, I'm not one of those 12. You know, I'm not, you, I'm not the guy you think I am. You know, so he's going the opposite side to tell his lies. You know, he's, he's straight up lying. But it was all understood because uh, that's, uh, you know, if our father's the devil and our nature is evil, then we will, we will, uh, those are the things we do. I mean, it's just, uh, that's why we have to be converted. We have to have a change and become new creations with a new nature. Praise God. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, right, right, right. Mm-hmm. Very likely. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and he was he was worn out too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he he. Yeah. We we don't know whether he cared or not. I'm sure he did. But as you're saying, the fact is, he was by that stage in his life. He mean, you know, it's like, well, the deed is done. I can't change it. I mean, what, it is what it is, and, and uh, you know, and, and of course, let's face it, I mean, he loved both his children. So, you know, and love covers a multitude of sins from God's side. I mean, so look how he is with us. I mean, look how much he cuts us slack all the time. <laughs> we, we stumble and fall, open mouth, insert foot, and, and he just keeps on picking us up and putting us back. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Maybe that's what, what did it. Um, I, I put in my own life right now, I put a lot on, on revelation. God reveals yes. certain things. I don't know how. Yes. You know, yes. Yes. No, the revelation is huge. That's why we started with that prayer, open my eyes. I mean we're talking about revelation. We're talking about the God pulling back the curtain of heaven and showing us the 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 things that we can't see or know or understand. So you're exactly right. Um He may have had more and even with his mother and you know I was a little hard on her at first okay I admit but uh, I think on both sides um, even without them being aware like say in, in the case of, of uh, Moses and his parents saw that he was a proper child which means he was very special they knew that God's hand was on him for some reason they didn't understand it but they had a knowing and I think you, you may well be under something there brother that uh, you know parents have sort of you, you know we call it sixth sense or but it's it's really a, it's a it's a god awareness that we don't even recognize it as god but somehow we just sort of like in the father's case he just said well okay this is god you know i don't understand it don't like it don't think it's right or fair whatever but you know i believe god's in this you know and he just went with that and uh and i think the mother probably had a sense that <clears throat> that uh Jacob was supposed to be the one to have the birthright and the blessing and and you know well of course what uh, Abraham's wife Sarah I mean she had to help God out you know and uh, of course Abraham didn't hesitate to take her up on the, you know so the younger good looking woman he said oh yeah well this is a good deal you know so he's and and so they both were complicit in in that uh, sin uh, and yet in the midst of that, I mean, God is uh, working through it. I mean, he's just lovingly bearing with them as they stumble and fumble along until finally they give up and, and allow him to take over and do what he wanted to do all along. But uh, again, there we, we take a lot of 
aches and pains uh, that really we could have avoided if we had just uh, sought the Lord first and foremost. But uh, part of the learning process is we do have to learn by the school of hard knocks sometimes. And uh, I, I believe all of us have to go to the far country. Some go farther, some stay longer. So, <laughs> so our prayer should always be, well, Lord, uh, let me learn quickly and, uh, you know, and, and, and cause me to, to lock in on you so that I don't have to keep taking another lap around Mount Sinai or some such. You know, we want to really get on board and get on track and go forward with the Lord here with our lives. You know, don't, uh, whatever it was in the past, or however much of a mess it was made, well, praise God, His mercy and grace over, overcomes all that and uh, forgiveness and restoration. But let's start point, from this point forward, uh, make most of what we have left. You know, let's redeem the time here. Uh, buy up these uh, opportunities that are precious from the Lord. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so so she had had a... Yeah, so see, and that is what I'm saying, and that's like even in the promise that... Uh, yeah, and that was, of course, the thing with Sarah. I mean, she knew, well, look, I'm too old and I can't have a child, but obviously God said he's going to bless us, and if we don't have a kid, we better get one, and so, so let's figure out how to do it. You know? And uh, But uh, the, the, the thing is, let's say with uh, 